so glad to see you all here. We welcome everybody that's online. We're here for our second week. Everybody say week two of our transformation experience. It's awesome. Yes, I'm so excited. Today we're going to be talking about alignment. So before we get started, I'm just going to kind of let you know what the service will look like. We'll do some worship. We'll have a message. We will be taking first fruits today. So if you'd like to go ahead and start preparing for that, we're going to give our first fruits. So this is what I want us to do. Let's align ourselves. It's alignment. So let's stand up. And I'm going to call your spirits to attention. Do this. Put your hand on your belly. And say, Spirit, Spirit. wake up. up. Listen up. And soul, Soul. line up behind my spirit. And body, Body. line up behind my soul. So that I'm properly aligned in the way that God designed me. Amen? Amen. Awesome. You feel that shift? When I do that, every time I do that with our students all the time when we teach class, I call their spirits to attention. You can just feel everything shift when you do that. And it's almost like every little cell in your body goes whoop, and it just lines up. (laughs) It's a great feeling. So, So do that for yourself. Line yourself up. I do it daily. And I can feel when I don't. I can feel when I forget to, to, if I get up and I hit the ground running and I haven't done it, I can feel it. Because usually it's something in my mind or something that comes out of my mouth that I'm like, eh, that's not, I wasn't aligned in that. <laughs> and I can feel that I'm off. So do that for yourselves and start aligning yourselves in that way. It's just, it's just a great way to start your day. So y'all ready to worship? Yeah. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. And we thank you that your spirit is aligned with our spirit this morning, and we're just going to bless you today with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds, everything that we got. We're going to give it to you today, Lord, and we thank you that your presence is here in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, we worship you today. Can you just lift your hands with me to heaven as an act of worship and just 
Lord, we just worship you. Lord, you're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the author, the finisher of our faith. You are the one who hangs all of the eternal weights of the world in balance. You're the one that holds the very breath of our lungs. You're the author of eternal life. You are the King of heaven and the King of earth. You are our eternal Savior. You are the bright and morning star. You're the lily of the valley. You are our, you are our soon coming King. You are the Lamb who's taken away the sins of the whole world. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Rohe, the Lord our shepherd. You are Jehovah Nissi, the Lord who fights all our battles for us. You are Jehovah Shema, the God who said, I would never leave you nor forsake you you are Jehovah Raha our shepherd our healer Lord we bless you today we thank you you are Jehovah Shalom the Lord our peace and we thank you Lord we just speak peace to the world today in the universes that we say the Prince of Peace is ruling and reigning in all wars in all nations in all circumstances in all situations in my life in your life in our family's life we just thank you Lord we decree you are the Prince of Peace and we thank you for the peace that we feel in this room today we bless you we thank you for your presence we thank you for our worshipers we thank you Lord for all that you're doing in our midst and we thank you Lord that something significant will happen in our lives today because of your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit we thank you for that in Jesus name and everybody in agreement said Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise this morning? Isn't he great? Amen. If you don't mind, before you sit down, could you just turn around and say something kind to somebody? You just, just bless them and say hello and just say something kind and speak peace to someone today and tell them thank you for coming out to worship with us and being a part of our day. Wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord together, isn't it? We, uh, we're headed for some really cold weather the next few days. We want to know our church is a warming station. And so if you knew of someone in the area that's without heat or without power or any type of circumstances like that, we'll be more than happy for them to be here and we'll find a way to take care of them and feed them and whatever necessary over the next few days. So keep your hearts and minds open for those that may be in need at this time. And we want to make sure we look after each other the next few days. Amen. And some of this uh, inclement weather. Uh, I want to say uh, it's just a blessing to have started this series last week. Uh, as we're moving now into a brand new Hebraic month, we're in our transformation series. Last week was on identity. And if you hadn't had time to delve into that, you can go back online and watch the message. It'll set the tone and the foundation. We're talking about identity, alignment, empowerment, and assignment. Our mission here at Word Alive is to see lives, a state, and nations transformed. And we really believe that God has given us this prototype, this message, to help people align their lives with the kingdom of God. Now, today you're going to hear a message in just a few moments about alignment, how to align with heaven for your personal life, your family, your spheres of influence. It will be profound as you hear uh, this principle of God's Word of how to align, but also we're at a significant time. We're at a brand new Hebraic month of Shavat. Started last night. I don't know if you had got to go outside and look, but I saw that thumbnail moon, and it was gorgeous last night, showing us it's a brand new cycle. You say, well, why is this important? Because good news is you're cycling. You're not going linear. God is not linear. God is cyclical. What does that mean? Why is that good news? If you made a mistake last month, you get a do-over this month. Touch your neighbor and say, I like do-overs. Right? If we, if we missed it last month, we get to pick it back up this month. This is why you need to understand how God's timing, how God's systems work. I've been meditating on Isaiah 33. It says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. Now's not time, and I don't mean this in any uh, arrogant way, but now's not time to be an ignorant believer. 
We've got to be wise and understanding of how God works and how to work with God so that we can navigate all this darkness that's in the earth realm right now and that we can continue to shine and live in the benefits of heaven. And so I'm excited that you've taken time to be here today, especially those that are watching online as well. At the end of the service, we'll take, or end of the message, I should say, we'll take just a few minutes. Those of you that want to give first fruits, as you'll hear about today, you'll be welcome to do so. In the month of Shabbat, just a simple uh, definition, it's the month of trees. And this is the month to meditate on Psalm 1. You shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, and you will flourish in each and every season of your life, and whatsoever you touch will prosper. So touch your neighbor and tell them this is a time to be blessed. This is a time to be blessed. Now, we'll do this at the end of the message. Actually, this is the month to shout, my blessing is on the way. And so we'll do that together at the end of the meeting today, and we'll declare that out into the atmosphere. But I just want to show you a couple of quick things to celebrate as we're moving into the message today. First of all, I think I have a map that shows you who all is engaged uh, with our transformation process. You'll see it's on almost every continent across the whole U.S. I think we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 or 500 folks now, or families, I should say, following us in this transformation message. And then Friday, I, was, I had the honor, let me show you the next page, I'm on Zoom call there speaking to 20,000 Russian-speaking people around the world. They were from... Uh, they were from Germany and France and Russia, Ukraine, Latvia, uh, Georgia, not Georgia next to Alabama, the Georgia way over there, uh, and all these Slavic-speaking countries and 20,000 people. Can you imagine technology that allows you from right here in Coldwater, Alabama to speak to 20,000 Russian-speaking people around the globe, and we were able to teach them about what you're going to be taught today, the power of identity, alignment, empowerment, and assignment. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world, then the end shall come. And so we're seeing that great fulfillment of that and excited that you're here today to participate with us in this journey as we're looking forward to transformation. Today, the principle is going to be taught by Joshua and Jamie Scroggins. There are Yes, a cheer. I like that. They're directors of All In Alabama, our statewide movement. So would you welcome them as they come to share God's principle today? Come on. Got shouts and cheers. Good morning, Word Alive. It is such an honor and a privilege to be able to share with you this morning. Let me get my technology set up real quick. And since it's my first time to really release the word of the Lord in this house, I just want to start with honor, if that's okay. Can't go wrong with that. So first of all, I just want to honor my husband, Joshua, as Kent mentioned. He and our three children, they're amazing. We've been married almost 20 years now, and, uh, and I actually did not encounter the Lord until after we got married, so less than a year after we were married, uh, I was radically transformed. And so when I say that uh, this guy married one girl and woke up with another one, I am not kidding. So the joke around the house is that he's on wife number four now uh, because he never knows what level of Jamie he's going to get from year to year. What crazy thing are we doing this year? And even like uh, selling everything we have and moving across the state. So yes, he's amazing. And uh, he has loved me and champion me and our family more than anybody else on this planet. So I honor him this morning. And we do have three wonderful children. Our oldest is now married and uh, has given us a grandbaby who is the light of my life. And so we're having a lot of fun with that. Amen. And then to Ken and Beverly, Joshua and I have had the incredible privilege to walk with and serve a lot of different leaders across the body of Christ, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to so many on our spiritual journey. But Ken and Beverly, you are unmatched in your generosity, in your authenticity, and in your willingness to go after God no matter what, and you've truly changed our lives, and we love you very much. So give Ken and Bev a great big hand. Amen. Amen. And last but not least, my uh, wonderful father and brother, came all this way this morning to be with us, and so I love them dearly. just want to honor them. 
Amen. And to you, Heavenly Father, now we begin. And you saw this day before it ever came to be. You wrote it in the book before it came to pass. And so I thank you for every person in this room. I bless Word Alive this morning. I thank you for the way that they've welcomed us. I honor them this morning as well before your throne. I now give you full permission, Holy Spirit, to have your way. I give this time and this day back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So my assignment this morning is to walk with you through these principles uh, within alignment, calling it reordering your life by God's design. And so we've taken this all over the state of Alabama, praise God, based on this premise. You have everything you need to live the life that God designed for you. The key is not to find something more, but to first set the things that you already possess in order. Amen. And so we like to use this illustration of a magnet with a piece of metal. And how many of you know that you can take a piece of metal that either has never experienced power or maybe just lost power, you can put it next to a magnet. It will actually cause all the molecules within to realign and power to begin to flow. That's an amazing concept. And you can see this in the scripture. This is the promise of God in 2 Peter 1.3. Through intimacy with Christ and God's invitation into salvation, everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. So look at your neighbor. we got to do it once and say everything. Amen. So I want to tell you a little bit of my history walking with God into this concept of alignment, and then I'll jump right in. So this started for me back in 2017, I would say, for Joshua and I, and um, we'd been walking with the Lord for probably a decade at that time. We were serving in ministry in all kinds of capacities of leadership, teaching the word of the Lord, but there were some things in my life that were not working, and I was seeking the Lord, and he sent me to a place that I never expected. Uh, I've always been a word girl, but I never wanted to necessarily be the Nehemiah girl, but here we are. And so the Lord took me to the book of Nehemiah and began to unfold for me this amazing heavenly blueprint of transformation, first in your personal life, then in your family, then in city, states, and nations. And so I think, wow, God, that's amazing. I walked through it. I never intended to write a book, but like Jeremiah said, it burned within me. And so January 1, 2018, I authored this first book, and it's about my personal journey and, of course, the first portion of Nehemiah. So I think to myself, okay, I get what this is about, and now I'm just going to write these other two books, right? The next one on family, the next one on cities, states, and nations. But it didn't quite work that way because there were some things that the Lord wanted me to understand before I was able to birth the other two. And it wasn't until we were traveling the state of Alabama last year, this is so amazing, And we're teaching on these concepts of alignment. And the Lord says, why don't you revisit the book of Nehemiah? I want you to see something you missed. And so the Lord showed me that the book of Nehemiah is as much a book of alignment as it is anything else. And this is amazing because it takes the pressure off of us to be something or to produce something, right, that we're trying to be or to produce because Nehemiah was not a man necessarily with some special anointing or some special skill that was greater than other people who couldn't get the job done. He did have the anointing of the Father. He did have the assistance of the Holy Spirit. But more than anything, he understood the concept of alignment, of walking with the Father in appointed times and leveraging, this is beautiful, his time and his resources within the proximity of the relationships and the position in his life. Not for his own personal gain, but for the kingdom of God to be birthed. And so if you go back and you read this story, it's so beautiful. You'll see that God tells us these things were happening, not randomly, but at appointed times. So it'll show you at the very beginning, he starts in the winter month. Grace and favor come into his life. It's the winter month of Sheshvan. Interesting. He prays for four months. Then he shifts over and uh, he starts journeying to Jerusalem. And lo and behold, it's Nisan. This is the month when the Passover is. This is when all the Jews would travel to Jerusalem. So this is very strategic. You've got a three-day portion in there, just as the three days 
of Christ. It's amazing. He goes on. He finishes in the month of Elul. It fully culminates, and a whole nation's recovenanted to God in, guess what, tabernacles. And so this is just a beautiful thing that we can see. And so this is my journey with God, learning alignment. And so Second Peter, as we continue there, goes on to say, as a result of this, God has given you magnificent promises beyond all price, so that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with his divine nature by which you've escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. And so we see this pattern in Scripture where God calls his people to himself. We begin to walk, as Kent preached last week, in identity and begin to hear the voice of God. We start in this intimacy with him, which is true alignment, and we begin to discover, hey, there's more to this thing than just salvation and coming to church on Sunday, but God actually has great and magnificent promises for our lives. We begin to partner with his nature, and we start to see this transformation. And I just want to say that this is not a microwave thing, but alignment is a thousand everyday choices in agreement with God's design that over time produce this result. But there's one small problem that Peter goes on to tell us about. He says, hey, if anybody lacks these things, he's blind. He's closing his eyes to the mysteries of our faith. He's forgetting his innocence, for his past sins have actually been washed away. So if we can, just for a minute, I just want you to posture yourself with your hands out, and I just want to pray for our eyes real quick before we go any further, if that's okay. All right. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the story of Saul being transformed into Paul and the magnificent effect that he had in culture and in time. And I thank you that you sent a man to open his eyes. And you said that when Ananias prayed for him that something like scales fell, that natural and spiritual uh, blinders came off of his eyes. And he was able then to hear the call of God on his life, to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, and to go forth and transform the world. And so I praise you and thank you now. And I release that same anointing in this room that scales will now, in the name of Jesus, fall off the eyes of every heart. And that according to Ephesians 1, eyes are now opened in the name of Jesus. If all they see is your face, if all they see is a tree like Jeremiah to start, I thank you for the fullness of development now of the eyes of the hearts in this room, for the revelation of Jesus Christ, the hope of calling the riches of his inheritance in us. Amen. All right. So, yes. So the solution that the Father gives us, we carry this around, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the cool thing about this is one translation of the kingdom is the basis or the foundations of God, even his feet, says one translation. How does he walk uh, in his divine laws? What works? And how many of you know that the Bible actually says first the things which are natural and then the things which are spiritual? It doesn't say it the other way around. It says first there was a natural Adam. And then there was a spiritual Adam. And so we can actually look, as Hebrews says, at the seen things to find evidence of God and the unseen things, right, which are established. And so we may not have all the answers in our life right now for a lot of different things, but we can say, Lord, what works? And we can know that every morning when we get up, the sun's coming up. And every morning when we go to bed, the sun's going down. And if I plant a seed in the ground, praise God, it's going to grow something right? Amen. These are things that work. And so God loves that we are in this natural room where he placed us and we don't have to try to grasp for things that we can't reach. We can look around us and say, God, what works that you created? And then we just start moving in that. And I love this scripture in Jeremiah. It says that this is an unbreakable covenant. These are things that you can't stop. It says, if you can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season, then you could break my covenant with David, my servant, the ministers, and the Levites. So these are things that work. Number one, God has a calendar. Number two, we can sow and we can reap, right? So a lot of people ask these days, 
Why are these concepts all of a sudden resurfacing, right? It's like in the last 10 years, you start hearing these things. The body of Christ is talking about it. And I would like to suggest, and first of all, they're not new concepts, very, very ancient biblical concepts. But I would like to suggest that it's in Ephesians 2 and 3 manifestation. And here's why. Ephesians 2 says that when Jesus fulfilled everything that he was meant to fulfill, that a separation wall was torn down between the Jew and the Gentile. And in that doing, he brought back together the Jews and the Gentiles into one new man in Christ. And that things, mysteries, it says, that were hidden for generations past have now been revealed. Now when? Now on this side of the cross. And so these concepts, and this is the powerful part of it, it says in Ephesians 3, they're not even just so that we can share with one another or demonstrate with one another, but they actually demonstrate the kingdom and preach the gospel when we walk in them to powers and principalities in heavenly places. Wow. I mean, this is powerful. So what's it doing when we walk in alignment? It is revealing the mysteries of God in the kingdom of Messiah, and it's telling the principalities and powers that his dominion will never end. It's more than just jumping into a schedule. And so where did the calendar, I'm just going to take you a brief history lesson. Where did the calendar that we actually use right now, where did it come from? Have you ever thought about that? And so it started, of course, with divine design. The Lord designed time in Genesis. Then you walk through the um, fall in the garden and the Tower of Babel. And you'll know that the Lord actually divided the nations at that time. And so you see that you really get a mixed bag of things going on with teachings. And there's really no standard of time because you've got most nations with uh, following their own ways and their own counsel. But there was one nation that God said, no, the enemy will not teach this nation. This nation will be my portion. And this is Jacob. This is Israel. And so he teaches them his ways, his time, and we know this now is a lunar calendar. But by the time of Jesus, you have Rome uh, rise in the earth. Julius Caesar comes along. He says, hey, guys, I don't really like this calendar. We're falling out of phase with seasons, and they were actually misusing it for political purposes. So people, they would actually extend the calendar so they could extend their political term. And so he said, I don't like this. And he calls on an astronomer who, guess what, knows the ways of Egypt and the sun god Ra. And he creates the first uh, solar calendar, right? This is the first time we see a January 1 mark. This is 45 BC. It would be 365 days. So this goes on for a while, but it's still just slowly immersing culture. Pope Gregory VIII rises up as head of the church And he says the same thing. Hey, guys, it's still not working great. Let's change some calculations. They do so. And bada bing, bada boom, we have the Gregorian calendar. And so here on this calendar, it goes 12 months, seven days of the week. And it is named after God's festivals and national leaders. I'll give you a few examples. January, it's the Roman god Janus. February is Februa. It's actually a Roman festival of cleansing right? Thursday is actually Thor's day, right? The God of thunder. So this is what this is based out of. And so it takes several centuries to immerse the world in this standard of time. But guess what? Today, 195 nations use this standard of time. What is my point? If you want to transform the nations, teach them how to reorder their time. Everything we do revolves around this calendar. And you might say, well, Jamie, that's a really awesome history lesson. What does this have to do with Scripture? So this is actually prophecy fulfilled. This is crazy to me. So Daniel 7, 25 says, And he will speak great words against the Most High and will wear out the saints of the Most High. Think to change the appointed times and law. They shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So I said to the Lord, well, who is he? And if you do any small level of research, because I'm not an expert on this, 
that fourth kingdom is Rome. And that's exactly what took place. But here's what the word of the Lord was. But the court will sit in judgment and his dominion will be taken away and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the most high. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions will serve and obey him. Who's it given back to? The people of God. This is the redemption of time. This is what we're living in. And we're rediscovering what this looks like with the Father. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 1. The original design, you start to see this connection between dominion and time. It says, God said, let lights in the expanse be for separating the day from the night, for signs and seasons, for days and years. They'll be for lights in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the land. And it happens so. And then God made these two great lights. The greater light for what? Dominion. Over the day, the lesser light as well as the stars for dominion. And so what is the point there? Our dominion in life is directly related to how we choose to align with God's appointed times and laws. And so what we do is we start to ask the Lord, what does this calendar look like? And I have a great image here that James Nesbitt designed, and I don't have time to dive into all the aspects of it, but I just want you to see that it looks like wheels within wheels. And this to me is a portion of what Ezekiel saw when he saw the wheels within the wheels, that if we get in tandem with God in such a way that we can align with this and learn this, and it's a journey. Let me tell you, I've been doing it for five or six years and I don't know the half of it. It is a complete culture shock to try to live in one culture and begin to learn another one, begin to learn God's kingdom. But if we can align with this, then we will begin to accelerate and we won't have to look to the right or to the left. Transformation will absolutely come. But there are four rhythms that we uh, talk about that you can see through scripture that I'll share with you today. The first is the daily cycle. This is called Yom in Hebrew. How many of you know that the Bible says in Genesis, evening and morning was the first day. So your day in God's kingdom actually doesn't start When the sun comes up, it starts when the sun goes down. You see this in the Hebraic world, in the Jewish world today. And so it's super important to learn to um, rest well at night and to prepare yourself when you go to sleep because it's how you'll wake up. The second cycle, of course, is weekly. This is our worship unto God all week through the work week. And then in that finished work, we rest on the Sabbath and we bring everything like the disciples did back to the Lord, and we say, this is what didn't work for me. This is what did work for me this week. And we celebrate with him, and we consult him for strategies for the week ahead. Then we have the monthly cycle. This is probably the hardest for people to understand, but the early church actually did this for hundreds of years. And this is Rosh Kadesh, which Kent was talking about earlier, and attached with first fruits. And you saw this in Jesus' day. They would actually uh, send out spies, and they would wait for that thumbnail moon. And then when they heard or they saw that it was out, they would celebrate unto God. They would actually call on the prophets to come in in this window of time and release the word of the Lord. And they would dedicate the next 30-day cycle in that moment, they would sanctify it unto God. And then we have the annual cycle. You see this, uh, Shana is the Hebraic term. And these are the Lord's feasts, the scripture says, not Jewish feasts. They actually belong to the Lord himself. There's three of those that we focus on. And these, by the way, demonstrate throughout the whole year, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Over and over, these are cycling through the heavens and through the earth. And so we have Passover, which represents the deliverance, redemption, and resurrection, of course, of Jesus Christ. You see this first in the book of Exodus, right? God delivers his people from Egypt with the blood over the door. Uh, Then you see this fulfilled in the life of Jesus. We have Pentecost, which again, this happened in the wilderness. This is fire and cloud and manna and the provision of God. This is also Torah, when God gave Moses the Torah. And then you see this fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. And then you see tabernacles, of course, Sukkot. And this represents harvest and presence and our future with God in the kingdom. And uh, when heaven and earth truly 
come one again. And so this has not yet fully been fulfilled. But again, you see this back in the day in the wilderness when they built um, tents and tabernacles and they celebrated the presence of God. And so you see, just like that magnet that we talked about at the beginning, that had lost its under that had lost power that God's people 400 years in Egypt either they lost the understanding or they never had it because it had been so long and so you see that uh, God teaches Moses when they come out of Egypt right Exodus 12:2 he has to teach him a whole new language and culture again and so the first thing he teaches them amazingly is this to you will be the beginning of months he teaches them his his calendar. And so here's the fact. We can actually commune with God at any time of the year, but he has designed appointed times when the windows of heaven open up to connect heaven and earth. And so the practical portion of this, if we can put that on the screen real quick, is just to begin to learn with God what this looks like for you. Uh, this, is, this doesn't mean that you can't do life in a Gregorian calendar, right? We're in transitional ages. And so we can work to do both and to learn God's calendar at the same time. You can use your phone to keep track. We have something we found that's amazing called hebcal.com. It will just put all these dates on your phone in addition to the Gregorian calendar. You can begin to track with God on that. And just begin to prioritize these appointed times and Sabbath We also uh, always track with this in our daily emails. You can subscribe to those, just real practical. And uh, Kent and Beverly do a great job. They continually teach on these Rosh Kadeshs and feast times as well. We do have a calendar that we will have online uh, here in the next couple of weeks at wayo.org that will also have the Torah, like we did last year, uh, readings each day. And then you can also plug into... um, to know what the, what the dates of the year are. All right. So I'll move quickly through this. The second thing that we can align with God is our money. This is from Proverbs three. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. That includes your time, right? Acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. And then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So this pattern that we see in scripture right there is that we're leaning not onto our own understanding anymore, but scripture says we have been given the mind of Christ, right? So we're not without understanding. We're just getting a new understanding. Then in all our ways and our time, we begin to acknowledge the Lord. And then we honor, we learn how to honor him with our possessions and first fruits. And so you say, well, where did this concept come from? Again, this is original design. Uh, we love to, to share this, but it actually was not law. You can see this all the way back in the book of Genesis as God's design teaching his sons how to steward the economy of heaven, the assets, and how to walk in his blessing. Okay, so the first place we can see this is in the life of Cain and Abel, right? I mean, this is their entire dilemma, is giving first to God. And my question is, how did they know how to do it? The father taught Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve taught their sons. And even though Cain didn't do it right, we see that this foundation of this principle is there in the very beginning. Then we see this in the life of Abraham. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And so Abraham goes to war. He's at war with multiple kings. And he wins this war by the grace of God, and he brings the spoils back to Melchizedek, who it says is king of righteousness, king of peace, without beginning and without end. Sounds familiar. So he brings this uh, tithe, this first of the spoils to Melchizedek. Melchizedek blesses him, right? But if you go to Hebrews 7, this is amazing. It says that that tithe of Abraham to Melchizedek was put into the spiritual account of his great, great, great grandson, Levi. And that whole tribe, it was accounted to them. So this shows us that this isn't just something we're doing that God needs us to do. This has generational effects and blessings when we align with first. It's amazing. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. That's awesome. And so again, how did Abe know to do that? 
somebody, his father, taught him this principle of the Lord. And then we see this in the New Testament. If the first fruit is holy, so is the whole batch of dough. And if the root's holy, so are the branches. And Kent does such a great job teaching on this. We know that mammon is unrighteous, right? Jesus tells us that. It's coming from a world system. It's coming from a world culture. But when we take that and any other possession we have, we bring it unto God as first, right? We give it to him. It sanctifies not just the beginning of that, not just that thing, but it sanctifies the entire rest of that thing for the week, for the month, for the year. Amen. And so this is the concept of Romans 11. So there's four things I'll go through real quick. We can use in scripture to identify how do we do this thing with tenths and firsts. The first one we're going to call the Lord's tithe. This was a 10% of the annual income that was meant to be offered for those bearing the responsibility of ministry and upkeep of the temple or tabernacle. And uh, that's pretty easy to understand. Then we have the family tithe. This was 10% of the annual income set aside as a blessing to your family to take care of your family, to plan for needs that might come up, and to be able to do the things as a family that God is calling you to do. How many of you know God really takes pleasure in us taking care of our families? So it's important to be able to steward responsibly and to plan ahead and to be able to step into the things he has for us without lack. All right, number three, the poor tithe. Every third annual family tithe was to be set aside for ministers, outsiders, orphans, and widows who were lacking. You see this often in the Old Testament in the fields of harvest and produce. What would they do? They would leave the outer edges so that anybody who was walking by who did not have a meal or have what they need, they could grab, they could eat, they could take of that that was set apart. The last thing is, of course, first fruits offerings. You see this all throughout scripture. And honestly, I still do not understand the fullness of this, but it's fascinating that in the book of Nehemiah, you will actually see they tithed a tenth of the people. So it was more than just the finances. It says that one tenth of the people after the wall was rebuilt actually were set aside to dwell in Jerusalem. The rest of the people were able to go and to build and to cultivate the kingdom elsewhere. But that one tenth of the people actually stayed there. So this is a powerful concept. And I will just say really quickly, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but Joshua and I have seen uh, first fruits work in our lives. And I would have probably picked any other kind of miracle for God to do in my life. But for some reason, he's done a lot of financial ones. But just an overarching view, I will testify that one uh, season we actually sowed a, a first, a seed, into someone's life for the kingdom, having no idea what it would produce and having no immediate results. And it was a great sacrifice. It was done in faith. And years later, the Lord said to me, you do know that that birthed this business that your husband is successful in now. So the seed we sowed years before with no result actually birthed a business years later. And let me tell you, that seed went so far that it actually provided for us when we transitioned and followed the Lord here to Word Alive. So the Lord is incredibly faithful when we align with this. So by participating in first fruits, our finances and time are sanctified. And these are some things that Chuck Pierce reminds us of. We are reminded that God is the source of all of our blessings. We are disciplined to seek God's kingdom first. We are stirred to remember that he is to be our first love. We're released into revelation that directs us from the wave offering to the harvest. We are assured of confidence that our Father will always provide. And we're initiated into new expectation that he visits us right? And harvest is coming in the days ahead. Amen. So the practical here that we just want to give you real quick as I finish is just to begin to practice good stewardship by creating a budget and pre-planning your giving, whatever that looks like for you. It's a practical way to step into this. All right. So everybody stand up. I just want to pray for you. Is everybody tracking with me? So, Father, I just thank you so much again for this opportunity. And I just pray now that you would seal this word, Father, 
in the hearts of every person in this room and every person who will hear this sound of my voice. Have your way in this, and I thank you, Father, that now that our eyes are open and we're receiving this mystery of the kingdom, that we are now activated and sent forth to walk it out in every area of our lives. Amen. That's good. Come on, let Jamie know how much you appreciate her sharing. Really good. Now, just keep standing. So, obviously, the reason we keep bringing this into the purview of our walk as a community is because we are believing for transformation. And we're learning that Jesus didn't just save us, right? but he's also provided for us. He has made ways so that we can live according to his divine design so that not only is our personal lives transformed, but the sphere of influence that we have. We're believing that these concepts will release such abundance that not just my life and your life could be changed, but your neighborhood can be changed and your community can be changed and your city can be changed and nations can be changed in Jesus' name. And so we celebrate the fact that God in intentionally calls us to align with the kingdom according to Matthew 6 33 seek the kingdom first all these things somebody shout things all these things shall be added unto us our culture teaches us seek the things but God says no just align with heaven and all these things will actually start seeking you so we are not following blessings blessings actually start following you so touch your neighbor and tell them blessings are tracking you down tell them blessings are tracking you down in Jesus name now here's the way we'll finish today don't leave please stay here just for a moment what we're going to do is there's many of us will follow the Lord today with first fruits giving. You can do it like I do. I'm old school, you know, the blue checkbook and write a check and make it, make it that way. Some of you, of course, are real digital. You can give online at wordalive.org or cash or however you want to give. But it's just a measure of faith. This is once a month where we actually receive a first fruits offering. So we'll have ushers that will come to the front with baskets. This is the only time once a month where we actually physically bring an offering to the Lord and uh, trust the Lord that he, as we enter a brand new season and a brand new month, God does extraordinary things for our life. But just after we give, then we're going to decree a blessing over our families and over our territories according to the brand new month of Shabbat, according to the planting of the trees, that we will flourish and we want to release Psalm 1 over you and your life and family and ask God to bless us as we take a step into this new season. So ushers, please come. Come to the front. Father, we lift up our first fruits to you, and we thank you, Lord. We receive this word of kingdom alignment, and now we move in faith to give according to your word and blessings with our time and our money. We believe Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase. Our barns shall be with are filled with plenty. Our presses burst forth with new wine. Honor the Lord in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Lord, we submit again our days, our time, our resources to be sanctified by heaven and for the blessings of God to come over us in this season in a new way, in a profound way, in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, amen. Come on, let's give and then we'll say a prayer.
All right. If you would stand back up with me. This is the scripture that God gives us for this month, and it's been done for thousands of years. This is the scripture that God speaks and declares over his people, Psalm 1. And we say this over you, your family, our church, our city, our state, our nation. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Your leaf will never wither, and whatsoever you do will prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We say, Father, as we've aligned with your word, that our tree is now planted by an unseen source, a river of provision that can't be seen with the natural eye, but it's a river of spiritual provision and access that ensures our family generationally will walk in the blessings of God, not the curses of this world. And so I call your people blessed. I call your families blessed. I call this church blessed. I call our recovery movement blessed. I call our city blessed. I call our state blessed. I call our nation blessed in the name of Jesus and what God blesses, no man can curse. And now our response according to the Hebraic custom is to shout, my blessing is on the way. Can you join me on the count of three? Shout, my blessing is on the way. One, two, three. Now come on, let's give God a praise in the house. Amen. A heads up, We're, there's plenty of resources in the connection. We've written several books along these lines. If you need any more information, you can go to transform, transformationcommunity.online to join a group. We love you. Be blessed. Next week, we'll be talking about empowerment. Love you guys and be blessed.